Ahoy hoy, I'm Planet Walk, and something that is very similar to Flat Earth that I haven't talked a whole lot about is Electric Universe. The only real difference between Flat Earth and Electric Universe is that Electric Universe sounds a whole lot smarter. This is because it doesn't go ahead and just outright deny all science like Flat Earth does, but it does generally deny a lot of science. But Planet Walk, you might be saying, haven't you responded to Ken Wheeler before? Isn't he an Electric Universe nut? And well, yes, I think that he's an Electric Universe nut, but he claims not to be an Electric Universe nut, or at least that's what it seems like. I didn't actually get to read the comment. But the Electric Universe people tend to find Ken Wheeler's ideas crazy, so that says a lot about Ken Wheeler. But anyway, today we're going to be taking a look at a video from a channel called The Thunderbolts Project, which endorses Electric Universe. And the presenter for today's video is someone called Michael Claridge, someone who actually does have a PhD and is the lead researcher for Sapphire. And if you want to know more about Sapphire, both Professor Dave and AB Science have made videos about Sapphire debunking it. So yeah, it's not as impressive as it may sound. But anyway, the video that we're going to be looking at is called The Light of Life. So enlighten us, Michael. In the early 1920s, Alexander Gurvich in Russia was experimentally exploring the idea that all life emits and is embedded in a morphogenic field. So an important thing to note about the morphogenetic field is it was proposed before we knew about genetics. Once we discovered genes and chromosomes, we found out how information is passed from parent to offspring. Now there may be some validity to the morphogenetic field, however, it does seem to have been heavily co-opted by people that think that you can use it for telepathy. And that is partially why I found it so difficult to research this, because when I search it up, it just comes up with a whole lot of things about telepathy. And that is one of the reasons why misinformation is so prevalent these days, folks. At one point, he took two onions out of the ground, careful to preserve their root tips, because the root tip has the highest rate of mitosis. The cells are dividing fastest at the tip. He pointed the tip of one root at the middle section of a second root. The cells in that middle section of the second root then started to divide much faster. He further experimented with blocking the effect and found that if he put a barrier between the two, he could stop the effect if the barrier blocked ultraviolet wavelengths of light. Here was the first modern experiment showing that living cells emit light and that this light can directly change the behavior of other cells. So something that Michael neglects to mention here is that his results were never replicated. Now replication is kind of important when it comes to science because if results cannot be replicated, then you can't really trust those results. And the lack of replication for Alexander's results wasn't due to a lack of trying. It was just nobody could replicate those results. So yeah, I wouldn't necessarily use that experiment as an example. Today, you can verify that your eyes emit light by purchasing a Hamatsu photomultiplier and going into a completely dark room and pointing the photomultiplier at your eye. Living systems emit light from ultraviolet to very low frequency radio waves. Different tissues emit different wavelengths at different times and at varying intensities. So I'm not going to deny that living things can emit light. Usually though, it's very low levels. Like levels that you're not going to notice with your eyes. Although if I'm correct, we do emit a decent amount of infrared light because, you know, we produce heat. And there is also bioluminescence, which is light that is produced by a living being that is noticeable. Why is this not more obvious? Well, I would argue that it is, since we've all noticed the light in someone's eyes. Or have said things like, she has a glow about her. Or, you were simply radiant. What? Those are just figures of speech. If I say someone has a glow about them, I don't mean that they have literally turned radioactive and are glowing. Like, I just mean that they look happy or something. That's what I mean. Like, if someone mentions the light in someone's eyes, that doesn't mean it's because your eyes are literally emitting light that people can see. This is just not how it works. Like, can someone please remind me how this guy has a PhD? Because you think he would be smarter than that. If we would all trust our own experience more, then science could progress much faster. So I'm not going to lie, that sounds very flirfish, but not only that, 
That is antithetical to science. Because in science, you cannot trust your senses. You need to repeat things to make sure that your senses weren't lying to you. In my opinion, it is not a good idea to tell people to trust their senses. Well, at least when it comes to scientific matters, but when it comes to everyday life, you know, have fun as long as you don't harm anyone. The amount of light given off by creatures varies quite a bit, from a few photons per second to tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands per second. That places the intensity in the range of walking in a dense forest at night when things are really dark. But somehow plenty of nocturnal animals do just fine. So a few things to unpack here. The first is that graph that he showed kind of proves my point. So on the left there it says UPE and UPE is not within human vision. So what is UPE? Well UPE is ultra weak photon emissions. Ultra weak photon emissions is what humans emit. So you are absolutely not going to notice the photons that other people emit. Trust me, I have been in a cave with other people where it was pitch black and I could not see anything, even my own hand right here. Also, what I just said there was a test. If you trusted me, you failed the test. Don't just trust me, there are other people in the cave that reported that they could not see a thing, even if they were to wave their hand in front of them. As for nocturnal animals, well, their vision is far better than human vision. They have far more cones in their eyes than we do. Having far more cones in your eyes allows you to see far more easily in the dark. What is this bio light doing? Here are a few examples. Over the winter, a seed will not emit any light. As the rain falls and the temperatures rise, in the quiet darkness of the soil, the seeds start emitting light, green light, up to 10,000 photons per second. Now this is the part where he cites things to support his hypothesis. Now, I can't actually find anything wrong with the studies themselves. Well, at least not with the first studies that he cites. But the important thing to note is that these studies reference ultra-weak photon emissions. It's not talking about going Super Saiyan. Our blood is constantly emitting light. Blood that had a higher immune response, in this case carrying more neutrophils, had a measurably higher photon count. To our alert biomedical viewers, this is probably the best area to look for new diagnostic techniques, as you can be absolutely certain that the complex rainbow of colors given off by our blood perfectly reflects the ever-changing physical and emotional state of our organism. So if you ask me that bit about blood being a perfect reflection of our physical and mental state, seemed a little bit weird. Because yes, I'm sure that blood giving off photons, depending on the amount of neutrophils are in them, can be used as a diagnostic tool. However, it does not then follow that that would be the best diagnostic tool, or even the most accurate diagnostic tool. It would be like using blood pressure to determine how stressed someone is. Yes, using blood pressure can help you determine if someone is stressed. But it can also be a result of other factors. And some people, they might not have a high blood pressure when they're stressed because they just naturally have a low blood pressure. But taking all that into account, yeah, you could estimate if someone is stressed, but it wouldn't be perfect and you would want to do other diagnostic tests. Essentially what I'm saying is you can't just simplify everything down into a silver bullet. In the old picture, any light present in biological systems was just the random thermal energies. And yes, there's plenty of that. But now we see that specific biological processes are initiated by specific frequencies of light, which are emitted at specific times and places. The biology of light is just as regulated as the biology of molecules. So from what I could tell, none of the papers that were actually cited in the video said that certain biological processes are initiated by light that's emitted from within the body. Obviously, there are certain biological processes that are affected by light, like, you know, seeing. And there's a whole lot of things to do with how light affects sleep schedule and stuff like that, but that's all to do with external sources. When it comes to internal sources, well, that area is far greyer. Especially seeing as it's easy to show that cells may emit light. It's not as easy to show that that light can be useful. We're down to the final two experiments. My runner-up favourite is based upon the fact that when you are in bright light, your brain emits more photons. Take two people, place them in the same room, along with an antenna which emits a weak oscillating magnetic field. 
Person one then stays in the room while person two goes to a second room, which is completely dark. Shine a bright light on the first person, the second person's brain will immediately emit more biophotons. This only worked if the two people first shared the experience of being in the same oscillating magnetic field. That's quite interesting. I'm, I'm not really sure how I'm meant to debunk this because this is a paper and this paper has been published. So maybe he has a point, but just to be sure, I'm gonna have a quick look at the paper first. So I had a quick read through of the paper and it set off alarm bells. The main thing that I noticed about this paper is that it didn't seem to have all the data in it. So if we look here, we can see that they had three pairs of individuals, not a great sample size, certainly not enough to draw a conclusion from anyway. Uh, and then it goes on to say figure 10 shows the pattern for one pair of individuals. So they had three pairs of individuals that they did this and we can go and see figure 10. Figure 10's right here. And they only showed the data for one pair out of the three. That is really suspicious to me. Now that's not to say that this paper is entirely invalid. It could be that I missed something. I was only having a quick look over the paper. But that being said, it is definitely weird that I could only find data on one individual, not all three of them, and three does certainly sound like a low sample size. And that's it for the bonus episode of pseudoscience papers just shoved in the middle of this video. Obviously one of the things that I want to know about these results though is have they been replicated because as far as I'm aware they haven't. They might have been but I don't read every single paper that comes out because I don't have the time for that. If you are someone that does happen to read every single paper that comes out then let me know if this paper has been replicated and if there's anything wrong that I missed with that paper. And also, NASA doesn't pay me to read papers for some reason. In fact, they tell me to keep away from the papers. But the fire that I caused was with a newspaper, not a scientific one. Life emits light. In some cases, we see the light is doing specific work, such as initiating mitosis. Except from what I've found, that doesn't appear to have been replicated. If humans were nocturnal creatures, this would all be obvious, as the luminosities are roughly that of a forest on a moonless night. I mean, stars do exist, so maybe they might light up things a little bit, but obviously only on cloudless nights. Although, honestly, I am not sure of how good an owl's vision is at night when there is no light source illuminating things. So it is definitely possible that they do see things simply because they give off light. I guess I was told that this is a messy subject, but I decided to make a video about it anyway. For those with a classical bent, you might be saying, Plato was right once again. Plato said that in human vision, light goes out from our eyes and blends with the light coming from objects and the combination results in what we see. Why does everything come back to Plato? Plato wasn't as smart as everyone makes him out to be, at least not by modern standards. In fact, I could probably start building up a repertoire of weird and wrong things that Plato has said for every time someone brings up Plato. Although my favorite one will always be how he defined a man as a featherless biped. Now we have proof that our eyes emit light. To a physicist, this was always an obvious possibility since all receivers are also transmitters. A radio antenna can send a signal or receive the same signal. It has to work both ways. The rhodopsin molecules in the retinal cells can absorb visible light. Therefore, they must also be able to emit the same visible light. Citation. Fucking needed. Like seriously, that was just a claim that was given without any kind of supporting evidence. Like if you build a satellite dish to only receive light, then it's only going to be able to receive light. For something to be able to emit light, there has to be some kind of mechanism there for it to be able to do that. And also, if something is able to emit light, then does that mean that it has the capacity to receive light? And if so, what do we mean by receive light? Why might the light coming from our eyes blend with the light coming in? To answer this, we can look at how the ears work. Decades ago, it was found that our ears emit sound. This was shelved as an interesting oddity until someone wondered if there might not be some purpose to it. 
They found that the ears emit sound for the purpose of actively producing signal cancelling and signal enhancement. So I can't find a whole lot about it saying that it does what this person is saying that it does. It seems that it may have a little bit to do with it, but not really a whole lot. Although it does appear that it has a function, and that function is that annoying little ringing sound that's constantly happening in my ears. Usually it's not so bad because I can ignore it, but when I remember it, I can definitely hear it. By the way, this is called tinnitus, I think that's how it's pronounced, and about 1 in 10 people have it. Ever wonder how it is in a crowded room you are capable of focusing in on one conversation, even someone else's conversation several feet away? It's the same principle as the noise-canceling headphones, but several light years more advanced, as your auditory system somehow knows where is the voice you want to hear, how far away is it, how long does it take for the sound to travel the distance between your two ears, and then in real time, as the sounds in the room keep changing, your eardrums emit a sound signal that will reduce everything else and enhance the particular voice you want to hear. Okay, so I just completely disagree with that. Especially seeing as the brain takes a 20th of a second to analyze sound, and the sound that it's hearing isn't always going to be the same sound, especially not background noise that you might want to filter out. I'd say the brain would actually be better off just processing all the sound and then working out which bits are important. Because if it has the capacity to filter out sounds using your eardrums, then it most certainly has the capacity to just analyse which sounds are important. The same is happening with your vision. I've not found the research yet, but it will come along soon enough. So, the same thing is happening with your vision, but you just haven't found the research. You're confident to say that it's happening with your vision, even though you haven't seen any research to suggest that it is. Okay, this really sounds like it's just a believing something and then finding evidence that supports that belief. You cannot have chemical changes without light. When electric currents change, light is produced. When light is absorbed, electric currents change. Light and electric currents are two sides of the same coin. They are the energy and the matter corresponding to each other. So again, this is why it's very important to define what we mean by light being absorbed. Do we mean just anything absorbing it, like a black colour absorbing it, or do we mean specific things absorbing it? Because if a black colour absorbs light, then a decent portion of that light will be converted into thermal energy, which is a type of kinetic energy. However, I expect that they're talking more about radio antennas. Which brings me back to, how does my screen absorb light? And we are ready for my number one favourite experiment involving the biophotons of DNA. The lab of Luc Montagnier was studying radio frequencies emitted by DNA. In the last of a series of truly boggling experiments, they placed a string of DNA into a vial of water and stimulated the vial with various radio frequencies. Then filter out the DNA. This leaves just water. But the water is now emitting radio frequencies, which it somehow got from the DNA. Place an antenna around the vial of water and send that signal to a second lab several miles away. In this other lab, you have a second test tube that contains water and all the individual building blocks of DNA. Broadcast our signal into the second vial. In a few hours, the original DNA strand will be constructed in the second vial. Sounds like magic, and I guess it is but it is also experimental data. This is getting tiring because I feel like everyone knows what I'm going to say because there seems to be a trend with this video. So that experimental data that he talks about hasn't been reproduced. I know, I am shocked as well. Also, several scientists have criticized that paper saying that it is one of the worst papers that they have ever seen. In fact, one of the direct quotes from Paul Myers from the University of Minnesota was, Who reviewed this? The author's mother? But funnily enough, it wasn't his mother that reviewed the paper. Allegedly, Luc Montagnier himself was on the editorial board. From what I've heard about the paper, it seems like it could be a good candidate for pseudoscience papers. Luc Montagnier has many admirers and many enemies. 
As often happens with people who achieve a great deal in life, shortly before his death last year, he had the distinction of being canceled for daring to point out some obvious problems with a novel medical treatment that was being rolled out around the world. Hence, it is possible that anything connected with him will be erased from future history. You know, I feel like he was cancelled about 10 years ago, you know, because he published a paper that some people saw as support of homeopathy. You know, a paper about DNA teleportation, which allegedly he was on the editorial board for when the paper got reviewed. Oh, and not to mention that he did promote conspiracy theories about COVID-19. I guess you either die a hero or live long enough to see yourself become the villain. The entire electrical body of the Earth is both the sender and the receiver of all the vibrations in all the DNA, in all the living creatures, over all the eons that have unfolded within her. Inside you are a trillion antenna that are both the senders and receivers of all the love and wisdom contained in the long body of our Mother Earth. I thought this was meant to be science, not poetry. Because that whole thing there really did sound like spiritual woo. I sure hope that he's not trying to pass that off as science. The AM radio antenna on your car is one-fourth the size of the AM radio waves that are being sent out from the radio stations. Since we have already verified experimentally that our DNA is an antenna that both absorbs and emits, we might ask, what is the length of our DNA, and is there any station broadcasting that wavelength? The DNA in one of your cells unrolls to roughly your own height. That's a notable connection. An organism the size of a person needs an antenna roughly its own size to adequately send and receive all the information required for an entire life from conception to death. Of course, he means it literally. He literally thinks that DNA is some kind of antenna. I'm honestly baffled as to how these people find Ken Wheeler crazy because I hadn't really heard a whole lot about Electric Universe. Yeah, I had heard that it was a crazy idea, but I didn't realize that it was this crazy. Sometimes it just sounded like Eric Dubé was trying out New Age Woo for a change. I don't know, this was certainly a wild video, which certainly makes me question how some people have managed to get their PhDs. Oops. You're probably right about that, Nigel. But anyway, leave a like and subscribe if you like this video. Leave a comment letting me know what you'd like to see me do in future videos. As always, a big shout out to my $20 or more patrons. Huge R's, MC Nutkin, Shaggy, Wolfie, Mori, Grey Morghost, Kid Vicious, Sarcha Campbell, Militant Agnostic, Kitten McKitten from Kittentown, and Craig D'Amelio. If you want to support me financially, you can do so on Patreon. There should be a link there. But anyway, I will see you in the next video. Between you and me,